area, there were a lot of information meetings as well in the Sligo area as well, but perhaps it went a little bit down and we have to give it a boost again. And there are, thanks for it, for the, what is it, the petition you said? Uh, yeah, an email yeah. action here. Oh, email petition. action. And there are petitions running, going on as well. And I think it's very good to have petitions, but there are so many petitions now. So people signing up on the website, on the online petition, on the hard copy, on the, the AVAs, um, A, 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 Z, uh, petition. And in my view, I think it's time that we coordinate now a little bit, that we know what we are doing, and because then we are stronger than just have their own groups. And yeah, please, I ask again, inform me, so I do the newsletter, and if you have news, send it to me, and I send it out, and then we know all about that's a little bit. Thank you. Um, I gather that um, from the internet and stuff that they're just about to go ahead with this in the manner, like the woman, the main, the main government woman, she's just about to grant the license to go ahead with fracking in the manner. I also know being Galway and Clare, nobody knows about fracking on the internet. I'd be honest, they don't even know they're asking what fracking is. But we have, I met some people in Clare, so we are trying to... I mean, it's helping, it's all growing, yeah. it's all good, but, uh, but it's I think it's all Yeah. <laughs> but it seems to be going ahead. Well, the reason that is the, the media. Yeah, but the media won't say that there's 12 counties in Ireland that this involves. They're saying that it's. Uh, 32. Uh, well, sorry, sorry. Probably best use the microphone because otherwise I'm waiting really for directions to who to give it. To. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anyone has a question for any of the panelists, I will take that first. First. If you don't have a question, bring it right there. Does anyone have a question? There's a question here. I'd like to hear more about what the status of the resistance against Shell and the oil industry in Nigeria is at present. Because I figure we've got you guys here and it's it's um, would be a wasted opportunity we just spoke about about fracking in, in this area, although I appreciate the fact that this is why we're all here. I mean, as, as we said earlier on, I think we practically all know each other, so uh, it, there's, there's no need really to talk about fracking in, in North Leiton. But I, I'd love to hear more about Nigeria and the status at the moment, because I mean, quite honestly, at the time, we all knew about the Ogoni thing, but I, I must say the last So the, the stage of the resistance now in Nigeria. Thank you for the question. Um, I, must, I must say that a lot has happened in Nigeria over the past few years. And if you go back five years, the resistance in the oil field uh, was in the media so frequently because at that time it was armed resistance. From around 2003 to 2000, from 2005 to 2009, there were very serious incidents of arm resistance in the oil fields, and it was pretty difficult for those of us who use non-violent means to work, because getting access to some communities were was very difficult. But in 2009, the government declared amnesty for all those with arms, and so they laid down most of the arms. We, we, we show that not everything behind the board. It's fairly peaceful and all production has gone up. But the, what we've been doing and supporting, uh, basically, first of all, is community organizing. Uh, because in the, up to the early, early 2002, 2003, the, and the 90s, the oil company and the government were masters at dividing communities. Uh, to the extent that some young people were paid what could be called salaries without being employed. So you, we had a ready army supporting impunity in the communities. Uh, what we did from 2007 
after analyzing the situation. Well, first of all, we got communities to examine their charters of demand, including the Bill of Rights. Because many ethnic nations were bringing different charters up. And by the time uh, an analysis comparison was done, they all came to the conclusion that they had the same they, they had the same obstacles to overcome. And that began to diminish the incidence of inter-community clashes, which were very violent indeed. And then in 2007, we began to a social engineering process of creating what we call host communities network. And as of today, we have this community, about 300 communities, and that network in Nigeria now, both in the oil fields and the solid mineral areas in the northern part of Nigeria. We have seen ourselves replicated in Uganda, East Africa, as well as in Ghana and West Africa, and some parts of South Africa and Cameroon. Uh, what it means is that communities uh, don't go into conflict with one another because they derive benefits and these other ones lack benefits. Uh, we they now agree that whether you have industrial installations or you only suffer impacts of incidents, you are both in the same boat. And so communities are now fighting to recover, to have, to have the environment clean up and to stop the kind of uh, want of destruction that is going on. So that is one excellent tool that is being utilized in resistance in the oil fields. Secondly, communities are training themselves to be their own environmental monitors. So that before anything occurs, well, as soon as anything occurs, they're the ones who tell the whole world about it. They don't keep information, they send information out, and using the media, this places a lot of pressure on the situation, on the polluters. I'll give you one example. Um, yesterday, today's Friday, Thursday night, about midnight, there was a major oil spill on the Shell's facility in the Niger Delta. And because the report came out by the time as people were waking up, the media were really aware of it. And this was in the back of nowhere you know, very far remote place. Now, Shell admitted that they had a pump failure, but then they insisted they had no oil spill. But there are photographs everywhere. People are, people are right, they see the spill is flowing, it's going to the ocean, it's flowing in the rivers, it's flowing in the, in the swamps. And so the people are able to monitor and insist on holding corporations accountable for their actions. And it's achieving some results. But so far, it's not stopping the pollution. The other tool being utilized is litigation. As Sister Mandela mentioned, uh, we have several cases ongoing now on human rights abuses as well as environmental pollution. And the cases, the cases, case, the cases in Holland, for example, is about oil spills that occur and to which Shell claims they've cleaned and remediated the environment. And if you, if you go to a place that they say they've cleaned a, a pollution, if you dip your hand in it, your hand comes out covered, completely covered with crude oil. So you don't require a scientist to tell you the water is polluted. It's so obvious. But still, they will say they've cleaned it. So there are many, many, many different ways. We're using cultural tools. And of course, you know, in 2002, the women of Nigeria began what is known as the naked option. It's an old cultural, traditional tool where more elderly women go to a corporate <coughs> office or installation and pay off is the ultimate cost you can place on a man or on a corporation when elderly ladies take off their shirts. And so that, that option, that option is also being used, was used in 2002, that's when it really became modernized, but now it's still being used frequently. And of course, direct action blocking access to facilities. The, the people are so fed up with 50, over 50 years of pollution that merely paying compensation, that is being demanded, but that is not enough. They're asking for a cleanup. And that is the major position that Ogoni's struggle has gotten to now. And the government has just set up what they call hydrocarbons pollution restoration project to begin a cleanup 
for going in large. But again, we're still putting pressure on the government because that project has no budget. And you require billions of dollars to put to, to begin the actions of playing up the environment. But it's consistent, uh, organized and coordinated resistance going on. There's no let up at all. Just one final remark from me, anyway. My experience has shown me that there will always be a diversity of groups. And in any community, there will be those who are passionate, as the man said. Those, for example, we did a lot of parade monitoring in my time up in the north. So there are many good, strong Republican nationalists who locked their door and went away on their holidays on the 12th of July when the passionate people were sitting on the road. So I had to do a lot of sorting that out in my head. And my conclusion was there is no homogeneity in any group. And we as activists have to build that into our competence, how to deal with that. And I just would make an absolute and utter appeal that an activist group makes unusual efforts to keep harmonious relations going in the community. For those who are scared out of their wits, and there are many, the presence of the activist creates shocking tension. I can imagine the homes in Eris on a school morning when the daddies and mammies were going out to sit on the road and be beaten by the police, leaving their five-year-olds, their ten-year-olds, their fifteen-year-olds at home. And the trauma that that caused. And there's a huge amount of trauma in any community where there's this kind of tension. So I'd love to see it on the agenda of every group during a meeting. This week, how did we keep harmony in the community? Did I refuse to speak to somebody? It's an empowering thing to allow difference to develop, to acknowledge that I have an insight, I have an education, I have an experience that the person next to me doesn't have. But I must do my best to ensure that that person doesn't feel threatened by me. Because there are families down in Eris where brother does not speak to brother and sister does not speak to sister. So I would just make that appeal, now that you're at the beginning, that you would give some consideration of how to sustain harmony, and to be very strong activists, but that that somehow is ameliorated by your own approach. You have to think up the mechanisms, I can't think them up for you. But my God, Eris is fraught with pain from top to bottom. And I would say the same in Ogoni and in many other of the communities where this kind of activism has to be initiated to get some kind of success. Thank you. Thank you. Really powerful stuff from everybody there. Um, so we'll just see, before we go to the comments, does anybody have a question? We have had uh, vacant meetings going back now over 12 months and we've heard people from different parties, or different parts of the world, I should say, talking about their experiences in countries where Shadow have been operating, which is good, and we have it here tonight as well. But do you think, I think it would be a good idea 